it's not only that we don't want the U.S. to have a war on Venezuela. We're not fighting war. But the true anti-war people want to do is fight war propaganda. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com coming to you on the 28th of January 2019. Um, But by the time, between the time this conversation is recorded and the time you're watching it, the ongoing live news event that we're talking about may have moved on. What are we talking about? Well, first of all, who are we talking to? Today we're talking to Daniel McAdams, who I am sure you will be familiar with for his work with the Ron Paul Institute at ronpaulinstitute.org and, of course, the co-host of the Ron Paul Liberty Report with Dr. Ron Paul. And he is a previous guest on The Corbett Report. If you missed our conversation last year about the State Department's troll farm, I suggest you go back and rewatch that. The link to that will be in the show notes uh, for today's conversation, along with everything else we talk about. Daniel McAdams, thank you once again for joining us. Thanks so much for having me back, James. All right. Well, today we are going to be talking about uh, another foreign policy crisis. It seems in the never-ending um, uh, parade of foreign policy crises that uh, continue to to spill forth through the news feeds. This one particularly worrying. It, re- it revolves around what is taking place in Venezuela right now. I'm going to assume that a large portion of my audience has some familiarity with the events that have taken place there in the last few weeks. But for those who are either unfamiliar with it or experiencing a bit of deja vu. What? There's a U.S.-backed coup going on in Venezuela again? Perhaps you can uh, let us in on the details. What is happening in this latest repeat of this ongoing story? Well, it's, it's the, you're right. The question is how far do you go back? 2002, 1998, you know, that's when the U.S. first had Venezuela regime change in their sights when Hugo Chavez was first elected. And yes, he was elected uh, many times. Uh, but I guess you trace it back to the, ele- the presidential elections uh, last year, last spring, where Nicolas Maduro, who was the handpicked successor uh, to Hugo Chavez, but was himself, of course, elected, uh, was up for re-election. Uh, the opposition has done everything it can to get some traction in Venezuela, and it's not been able to. Uh, you look at the polling numbers, and they're just not popular. It's just true with most of the uh, with most of the opposition that the U.S. supports overseas. Uh, so what do they do? This is a, this is taken out. Of, this is a time tested time-tested thing that they do when they want regime change. The opposition says, oh, yeah, well, we're not going to participate in the elections. So they didn't participate. And so guess what? They didn't get any votes. You know, that's kind of how it works. And so they didn't get any votes and said, well, you're cheating. Uh, you know, and so this is uh, this has gone on from May until now. What's different is that there had been negotiations. Maduro was just uh, sworn into office uh, a little over a week ago or about a week ago, which is really sort of what triggered uh, this latest U.S. coup attempt when he was sworn in. But until that point, and particularly in December, there had been negotiations between the government and the opposition. They were trying to work it out. They're trying to work out some kind of a deal. Uh, and uh, apparently from news reports, and I think I read a BBC report this morning that said this, maybe it was a different report, uh, that the U.S. intervened with the opposition, which they have been financing, which they have been supporting, which they have been backing, picking, etc., they intervened and said, don't take a deal, don't take a deal. Uh, and this is what they did to the Kurds, if you remember, when the Kurds are trying to uh, negotiate with Assad. So they don't take a deal. What do they do? Uh, Maduro is sworn in as president, the head of the National Assembly, sort of the equivalent of Nancy Pelosi, but not exactly for the reasons we'll probably get into later, says, you know what, I'm, I'm president now. Uh, Article 233 of our Constitution, which we can also get into later, uh, says I'm president Immediately, he hadn't even finished a sentence that the U.S. recognized him as president. So obviously there was collusion. We find out later that he was on the phone with Michael Pence, the vice president, the night before he said it, was given, no doubt given his marching orders by Washington, promised millions of dollars to do a coup, declares himself president. Maduro responds and says, the U.S. embassy is closed here. You're obviously trying to subvert my government. Uh, And that's kind of, I guess, where we are now to a degree. That's an excellent summary in a whirlwind, and there's a lot of things that we should pick out from there, one of which just strikes strikes you right in the face. So someone who has never even ran for president in Venezuela is now declaring himself president, essentially, and being backed up by the United States and an increasing list of U.S. allies who are now choosing to uh, recognize interim President Guaido as the, the leader of Venezuela. How does that happen? What on what basis are they attempting to uh, to pin the fig leaf of of legitimacy of this uh, this coup? And that is such a good a good point, James. Again, he has not received a single vote to be president of Venezuela. No one has voted for him. 
for this position at all. Uh, and in fact, he heads what is a legally a defunct uh, uh, legislative body. It was defunct in 2017 in favor of the Constituent Assembly. It's another complicated issue. But on what basis? Well, the basis, according to the State Department, which is awfully uh, concerned with the Venezuelan constitution, unfortunately not as concerned with the U.S. constitution when it comes to uh, U.S. meddling in war abroad. Uh, but, but this is the Section 233. It's very complicated, but essentially what the U.S. has claimed, what, what Guaido has claimed about 233 is absolutely wrong. Even anyone who reads this would say that they're absolutely incorrect. It's sort of like the people who um, in the U.S. are fantasizing about the 25th Amendment getting rid of President Trump. You know, uh, It's the same kind of conspiracy theory. All 233 says is if the president becomes permanently absent from office, the head of the National Assembly may temporarily, on an interim basis, assume the duties of president, sim- for, I think for 30 days, while an election is being planned and carried out. It doesn't mean if you don't like the guy who won, you get to be president, which is what the U.S. is essentially saying. It's so, it's so rudimentary and transparently false. But that's never really stopped one of these coup attempts in the past. And uh, as you allude to, of course, we have the same specters of uh, various uh, uh, deep state characters hanging around this. Of course, the green light apparently being given by Pence, but we also have the mustachioed walrus neocon himself, uh, John Bolton, appearing on multiple shows to talk about how U.S. oil companies are already lining up to get their snoots in the, the largest untapped oil reserves or the largest proven oil reserves in the world. Uh, in Venezuela. And also, uh, in an interesting maneuver, uh, Secretary of State Mike Pompeo is just appointed as a special U.S. envoy in Venezuela, Elliot Abrams. For people with uh, no historical memory, who is Elliot Abrams and what does that portend for the people of Venezuela? I mean, talk about the the neocons sure have a talent for kicking you in the face. You know, subtlety is not their best quality. Uh, you know, Elliot Abrams was was a, was a henchman under President Reagan, who was involved in all of the bloody wars, especially places like El Salvador, where thousands of peoples were murdered by right wing militias uh, sponsored by the U.S. Uh, I mean, if, if there's anyone who has blood on their hands, it's Elliot Abrams. Uh, he went on to star in a few other. A uh, short little mini series called the Iran Contra Affair, uh, where he was heavily involved in arming Iran uh, to help his beloved Contras as they ran roughshod uh, through Nicaragua, and uh, and then he uh, was convicted. Of course, he lied to Congress. He was convicted. Uh, President George Herbert Walker Bush uh, pardoned him, and he went on to star in another little mini series called Iraq War 2.0, where he was one of the prime. Uh, prime a planner is one of the prime propagandists, one of the prime, it'll be a cakewalk, don't worry, George W. Bush, we got this. Uh, this was his thing, this was one of his, this was his baby along with John Bolton and the other neocons. So a guy with a track record so crappy like this to all of a sudden be you know, raised to the level of you're the guy in charge of restoring democracy uh, to Venezuela, it really is kind of a sick joke, James. There's no other way to frame that. I mean, it's it's just so in your face, as you say. And But again, who could really find this surprising given the appointment of people like Bolton to the inner circle of uh, Trump's administration, where, of course, there will be the red hat wearing MAGA crowd that says that Trump is fighting the deep state and they forced him to appoint all these neocons to every single position in his administration. And now who would have guessed it? They're doing another neocon coup uh, takeover attempt. Um, I I think a more realistic assessment was posted up to ronpaulinstitute.org in the last couple of days uh, from Tom Luongo. Trump betrays MAGA over Venezuela, where he situates this in a uh, a part of a a quite obvious strategy of U.S. imperial energy dominance as a way of attempting to corner the markets and basically uh, uh, get get a stranglehold on its competition. I'm not sure it needs to be said, but perhaps you can expand on why is the U.S. so interested in Venezuela? Yeah, I think th- I think there are like two sort of parallel things from from my reading and thinking about it. One, of course, we know that Venezuela has the largest proven oil reserves in the world, larger than Saudi Arabia. Interestingly enough, it has a particular type of crude, and I'm not, I'm not an expert, uh, but it has a particular type of crude that needs to be uh, refined in a particular way. And where they do this refining primarily is around Corpus Christi, 
uh, down here in Texas. Uh, and I actually, I think some of the refineries are owned by the Coke Industries, interestingly enough. Uh, so you have this sort of this sort of situation where there's a weird symbiosis between Venezuela and the U.S. And despite all sanctions, we still get seven percent of our oil from Venezuela. So you'd say that's really a drop in the bucket. But the way world markets go, the way you know sort of supply chains work, that's actually rather significant. Uh, so on one hand, you could say this is just a bald oil grab, a bald resources grab. And I think you wouldn't be entirely correct. But I think that's only one half the coin, James. I think the other part of the coin is this obsession to deny others access to that. So it's not so much that we want their oil, because we got plenty of it. It's coming out our ears. It's everywhere. Just when they said peak oil was happening, they'll find it everywhere uh, on the one hand. But it's about denial. Denial uh, you have already seen the Chinese getting involved. They, they've got involved in the oil industry. The Russians are interested. Other co countries are interested. So it's actually more about denial, I would think, than actually just grabbing that oil because we sort of already have it in a way. Yeah. Yeah, that's an excellent point, point. and I'm glad you made that because a lot of people think that it is just about getting the oil out of the ground. In some cases, it's about keeping it in the ground, uh, depending on what interests are being served. And if you can starve out an enemy that is energy dependent, then much the better. Or if you have leverage over the EU or other places that need that energy, then that's, uh, that's another uh, arrow uh, in the quiver. Um, so let's address the, the, the sort of where... Where does this go from here? Um, as people might have heard, there was this order to get the U.S. diplomats. They had to clear out in 72 hours, and there was a standoff. Apparently, that's been extended. Now they have 30 days to clear out. But where? what are the next likely steps? What's happening from here? Well, this is the, the real question, Mark. And I think Dr. Paul just put out his column and, and uh, uh, where he, he writes that it's going to be a, a, real, a real pain for Trump. He's... I don't think he's well, he's thought it through. He's not a, uh, should put it this way, he's not a person who, who deeply reflects about things, I don't think. You know, we've, we've seen, to, if one thing we've seen consistent through the tears of his presidency, he seems to take on board the last person he spoke with. Uh, and unfortunately, that means with neocons all around him, you know, he's in a bad neighborhood. He's got a bad crowd he's hanging out with. Where does it go next? Well, the neocons want to, excel want to accelerate. They want to, um, uh, they want to, uh, really bring this to a crisis. Bolton tweeted, I think, just a few hours ago, to, to, uh, if Venezuela dares even threaten Guaido, there's going to be serious repercussions, clearly threatening war. The question is, would the U.S. really start a war against Venezuela uh, over this? Right now, perhaps not. But we don't know how they can escalate. We don't know where they can escalate. We saw what they've done in Libya. We saw what they did in Syria. Uh, we saw places like Yemen, Honduras. So we know that they control the propaganda machine. James, as you well know better than anyone, the mainstream media is in their back pockets. So they can make anything reality. They can make any lie reality. Next thing you know, Maduro will be spreading Viagra around to his troops like we heard about Gaddafi. So they can control that narrative. And we, who are trying to put forth a counter-narrative of truth, we kind of have our hands tied behind our backs. So... It's, it's difficult to say. Uh, it's a long answer to your short question. I think the neocons intend to escalate the Democrats in Congress, all of Washington, completely behind the president. All of a sudden, he's not Satan incarnate. He's kind of a pretty good guy, you know. So this is the real danger we face. It's a good point. I don't think even the American public, uh, as war happy as it can be at times, would be behind this particular military adventure en masse because there's nothing really precipitating it at this point. But it's always a question of how do you get from A to B? And there's usually a Gulf of Tonkin or something between here and there that could happen. So it's definitely something we have to keep our eyes on. But just to clarify, I'm a little bit confused here, Daniel. This means that Ron Paul Institute and yourself and Dr. Paul are now socialists and you love uh, <laughs> President Maduro and you've, you've changed allegiances here? Exactly. Viva la revolucion. <laughs> yeah, well, exactly. Just like we were Saddam lovers, we were Gaddafi apologists. Uh, we were, what's the word for Assad? Assad's, I uh, uh, forget the word that they use. Yeah, of course. This is the, this is the slur. This is the slime that the that the pro-war people do for anyone that says, hey, we shouldn't have a, not only should we not have a war, and this is a big point, James, this is something that, that I focus on so much. It's not only that we don't want the U.S. to have a war,